Hello, BookTube. I have another poem for you today, uh, which I confess I need more than you do, <laughs> to, to take my mind off me troubles. Take my mind off the fact that a tiny little bit of in-home construction has metastasized into tearing down and ripping apart virtually everything. Virtually everything. And it involves carpentry, and it involves electricity, and it involves plumbing. And it bids fair to last forever. <laughs> so when I get a moment, I am using that moment to make a video. Because house demolition or no house demolition, my imaginary booktube friends are important. How I wish uh, that I could do a live stream and connect with you all, with, uh, you know, with a hundred of you directly. But... The only way that I'd be able to do that is if I started a live stream at nine at night, and I'm missing a lot of people for the lateness of my live streams anyway, without making it even even later. We shall see. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going back to the well. I'm going back to this great poetry anthology that I've got so much use out of uh, for something that I found free at a little free library. This is the new poetry. Uh, it's an anthology from 1932, so none of the poems in here are new anymore. Uh, and somebody, years later, put it in one of these school dust jackets that were provided by holiday cleaners in East Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, nobody nobody filled out the back of it. I, I Probably they, the student were told not to. Probably were told, you know, we're going to use this book for many, many classrooms, so don't put your name on it. You're nothing. <laughs> uh, but the, the thing that, that always amazes me, that always intrigues me, is that this cover, obviously, uh, had to be put on this book decades after it first came out. So what is the life story of this book? There is writing on the inside. It is mostly a student in pencil, and it, they didn't last very long. Uh, did an adult buy this book in the 1930s? Did an adult buy a really clean copy of it secondhand in the 1960s as a gift or a prize or a classroom book of some kind? I'll never know. We'll never know. That's the one thing we don't ever know most of the time. Except for all of the new books on your shelves, most people don't know the whole story of the books that are staring at you on the shelves all the time. That's the one advantage that uh, antiquarian book dealers like Jason Harrigan have over the rest of us, is that it's their job to know every step of the provenance of their books. But even Jason, even people like him, uh, you go to an Oxfam shop and you buy a used book, you have no idea what hands it's passed through, what things it's seen. I'd love to know with this, but boy, oh boy, <laughs> boy, oh boy. I know it's just it's just good timing that this book came into my life right before the nightmare of flaking asbestos, but uh, I'm still finding a lot that's enjoyable in here. I want to read you a poem today by Joseph Auslander, uh, who was a, a poetry editor, he was a really good poetry editor, he was an industrious poet, wrote, I think, probably half a dozen uh, volumes of poetry, none of which sold like the Dickens, but they sold enough. They got enough notice so that people knew that he was a poet. In other words, he had a professional life. I'm sure that he has a box or more than one of collected professional papers moldering in some archive somewhere. No one's consulted. Uh, once again, the usual refrain, there has been no collected authoritative poems. Joseph Oslander, there's been no biography of Joseph Oslander. There's nothing like that at all. He's gone as if he'd never been, even though he was once upon a time a working, prominent, published poet. Uh, and we're going to read a, a really neat uh, poem of his today called Revenants. Must it be always so whenever rain rattles a little on the windowsill? that I shall hear at ledge and window pane a poplar tapping her golden nails until the ghosts creep back again? Is there no peace for you, ghost after ghost? I ripped you bleeding forth and watched you go, staring at me sideways with the most haggard look. Is there no quiet, no sleep, you prowling host? Why do you breathe like thugs who spring a lock, forcing the window of a dream? What wealth stuffs this autumnal heart that you should knock so furtively? Why stand upon your stealth? Gag the whirring clock. Enter me decently as you would the door, not of a, har of a harlot, but of a friend, and break my lonely crust with me. I have no more. Nothing that the paltriest thief would take. My key lies on the floor. When you have done with me, go as you came, erect and unabashed. And tell my dear in indelible lady that I am the same, and that she has no longer need to fear the poor noise of my name. 
uh, uh, Joseph Auslander was an unhappy widower. Uh, but, so there's a lady involved in this poem. And it's curious little ballet that's going on, right? The narrator of the poem is asking the question, why do ghosts behave the way they do? <laughs> why do they creep around at windowsills? Why do they creep around at night? Why do they steal into the room or into the person, into the, the mind, the, the sleeping or waking mind of the person? Notice he's saying, enter me as decently as you would the door, not of a harlot, but of a friend. Uh, why do ghosts act that way? The narrator of the poem wants to know. Why don't they, you just come in and what, how does he put it here? Uh, come in and break my lonely crust with me. Uh, have some bread, have some wine, sit at the table, and then leave. Uh, what was the word? Erect and unabashed, instead of drifting away or moaning away or something like that. Uh, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting motif. It's been asked by many poets in many poems. Uh, why is it that ghosts haunt? Why is it that they do what they do? And the standard, it, it, this, it was actually an... an a persistent question in medieval England, <laughs> believe it or not, and medieval Italy. Uh, it was a persistent question, and uh, clerics of the church at the time, capital C, no splinter Protestantism, uh, clerics of the church were wary of the answers to that question, because if ghosts can come back and walk through the door and sit at your table and share bread with you, then what are we saying about the afterlife, and especially damnation? Can't have that. Can't have anyone saying that. Can't have anyone saying that you can still love your loved ones in person after they're gone. Can't do that. Uh, but that even once that question was defanged, what still do we say about ghosts and why they act the way they do? Why not just come in and talk? And the last twist, I mean, that's a neat, that's a neat twist. I, I've seldom seen it done more gracefully than in this poem. And uh, the twist is added at the end that the ghost that visits the narrator of the poem is not his lady. She is not haunting him. He's asking the ghost that leaves to bear a message back to her. She won't haunt him, even though we get the clear sensation that he wants her to. What does he say? Uh... Tell my dear indelible lady that I am the same, and that she has no longer need to fear the poor noise of my name. It's quietly heartbreaking. There's a story behind this poem, as there is behind most really good poems. And I love a good... I mean, I think the story behind this poem is a love story, and a grief story, not a ghost story. But I love a good ghost story, and I love a good ghost scene, of course. I love, for instance, the, the ghost scenes in Hamlet when they're done well. I hate them when they're not. I hate them when they're not done well. If you remove the element of ambiguity, if you convince the reader uh, unfairly that the ghost of old King Hamlet is real and is telling the truth and should be obeyed, then you remove an active element of drama in the play. I always hate it when, for instance, movie adaptations do that. I have nothing good to say about Kenneth Branagh's adaptation of Hamlet, for instance, which is nine hours long. Uh, and one of the, the things that I don't like about it is that when the ghost is talking to Hamlet about what happened, that the, that the, 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 the serpent who stung my life now wears my crown, when the ghost is telling an astonished Hamlet all of this, we're seeing it in flashbacks. <laughs> Which kind of removes the element of ambiguity. It kind of removes the doubt. Uh, and also, I uh, admit it's effective, for instance, in the Ethan Hawke Hamlet, the movie, the Ethan Hawke movie Hamlet. I admit it's kind of effective when uh, Sam Elliott is the, uh, or Sam Shepard is the ghost of King Hamlet. And during the first scene, when he is, he is telling Hamlet, remember, 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 he grips him by the head, which ought not to happen. The ghost should not have the ghost should not have any physical ability to affect the real world. Otherwise, if he can grip Hamlet's head, why can't he kill Claudius? Uh, it was very effective for the moment. But it was if it affected this, it was cheaply done. But other ghost stuff, oh, <laughs> you you can count on the fact that if it's done well, I will love it. You can count on that fact, including 
of course, you know, you're going you're gonna to be able to see this coming. My favorite single moment in the West Wing is not the moment where we learn that the New England, the bookish New England president's favorite movie is The Lion in Winter, even though the writer at the time was such a raving cokehead egomaniac that he could tell us that the president's favorite movie is The Lion in Winter and then proceed to quote it wrong. <laughs> proceed to misquote the movie. <laughs> but, but you'd think that'd be my favorite moment, but no, of course, my favorite moment is when uh, Mrs. Landingham returns to the Oval Office while a hurricane is battering the White House, it, her ghost returns. And we know it's her ghost because at one point, one of the camera angles shows Jed Bartlett talking to an empty chair. So he's imagining things, or she is real, or she is a ghost. But whenever a writer decides to pull a gimmick like that, I just love it. Absolutely. If it's done well, I absolutely love it. Uh, and I like this for that reason. I like that. That, that animates my love of this, of this poem, Revenant. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap uh, we're gonna wrap it up there. That is your poem for today. It is Joseph Oslander, who's quoted a few times uh, in this anthology. He's he's got a few poems in here, but we're gonna move on. We've got a lot of other forgotten people, ghosts of our own, <laughs> to deal with. So the next time I can snatch a free moment, if I can snatch a free moment tomorrow, I will read us both a poem. Because <laughs> boy oh boy, is it a refuge. But uh, if not, I will as soon as I can. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.